loved your new album, Frost, that came out mm-hmm. not too long ago. That was really cool. It's um very like spatial, ethereal, makes me want to kind of like lay down and just like look at the stars. Like it's really nice. Yeah, it um yeah, I know it seems so current, but it came out in January, which I guess feels like ages ago, but um I feel like of all the things that I've released, Frost is really the one that kind of caters to that exact mood that you were saying. Like um, when I still lived in Los Angeles, a lot of the shows that I was playing, uh, people ended up kind of like on the ground and kind of like spacing out, which, you know, some people were like, oh, I'm sorry that I late. And I was like, no, 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 no. That means you're actually listening and you weren't like talking somewhere or like, you know, it's such a big form of flattery to hear that. And it's interesting with something like Frost because it sounds cohesive or people have told me that. And I, I mean, I thought it sounded pretty cohesive, but it's pieces from different, slightly different times. So it's like, I didn't sit Mm. down with the intentionality of it being like a piece of music altogether. It just sort of happened, Yeah, which has been like the total opposite of the record that I just finished writing now, which was like very intentional, like nine weeks of just writing. And, you know, so I'm glad it resonated with you. It's good. I mean, I listen to all types of music. I mean, the music I produce is very different than a lot of the music I even listen to. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely like good driving music. And I'm curious, like, I'd love to talk more about your music background and stuff too. But a lot of the music you've produced has been licensed with like film or like TV. How did you kind of get your influence for that more orchestra, more ethereal style? Is that something you've always been into? Is that something that you started producing more with intention, knowing that you could license it for TV or film? Like, how did that develop for you? I went to college. I, the, what brought me over to the U.S. Um, when I was 18 was I got into a music college. And when I got there, um, essentially, I sort of fell into the major that they had, which was film scoring. And... Um, And, you know, I'd never written orchestral music. I'd only ever like at most written like tabs for like a guitar or like chords for piano. So it was really kind of um, the training for that was really, really intense. But, you know, it was like analyzing classical pieces and analyzing scores. And I think that that's sort of um, what piqued my interest in continuing to do it. And I eventually graduated with a degree in film scoring, whatever that means, Um, And, you know, it took a, I took a bit of a detour and then eventually came back to it. And I do less licensing per se and more like writing custom things for picture. So, you know, it's like I get hired and essentially get sent the movie or the TV show. And then they're like, okay, write all the music sort of thing. And um, it's been a really long evolution. And, you know, obviously like the chops that I had when I started were not, are not the chops that I have now. So um, and hopefully in 10 years, it'll be even better. So it's it's been a real kind of like journey um, of learning how to break the rules of orchestral as well to be able to like accommodate for electronics, for example. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a fun journey. And it's been it's been really nice to have kind of as a career rather than having to rely on being like a touring musician, because yeah. especially nowadays, I feel like it's challenging. yeah. You probably get more sleep than other people who are relying on tour money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still go to bed pretty late, but at least it's like I'm in the studio. You know, it's it's yeah. kind of like what I'm assuming for you, too. Like if anyone that produces or writes or whatever, you're just kind of like in the studio all the time rather than sleeping at a Motel 6 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully nicer than a Motel 6. I don't know. That sounds kind of scary. You went to school for film composition and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you think if you had to do it over again, would you do it the same way going to school for that? Or would you encourage other people who are interested to go to school for that? Because I've heard both ways for people who are like, I'm glad I did it. And other people are like, I went into a lot of debt and I'm still not necessarily, it didn't give me more opportunities, basically. You know, I think that at the time, like if somebody was entering it at the time that I was and I started... I started uh, college in 2004. So it was a a while ago. You know, it was like pre-YouTube tutorials. It was uh, pre-Ableton Live. It was pre, you know, pre sort of like this democratization of technology and music where um, I feel like kids now, you know, literally teenagers or younger have these tools that like I was just being, were just being made available for me for the first time when I was in my late teens. So if somebody was my age back then, I would have said like a hundred percent, like it was great for me because I never studied classical theory. 
Um, I never would have, although I'm very motivated, I don't think I would have like bought like an orchestration book and read it sort of thing. Yeah. But I think that, that the style of music for film has evolved and changed so much that now, like today, if I was 16 and I was like, I want to do this as a career, I would maybe maybe take some online courses with Berkeley or USC or whatever, and then intern, just like go and learn because like you really, you really learn from like being in the room, you know? So like do that and then YouTube and the internet and just like, there's so many great um, artists that are also content creators that just like now you can essentially have like a university online. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I'm absolutely in the camp of like, don't spend $80,000 a year unless you like really, really need like the rigorous schooling. Like if you're good at school and you feel like you need that environment and there is something to be said about building connections, you know, like you go to these places because of the prestige of like the networking, whatever. Um, But truthfully, like I think now more than ever, it's exciting to see even like artists become film composers, for example. And, you know, mm-hmm. they don't have any formal training. If anything, I sometimes, if I, you know, if somebody reads my bio, they're like, oh my God, you went to all this school, you have a master's. Like, what do you, like, that's so lame. And I'm like, you know, you're not wrong, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. So. Yeah, I think you're, yeah, I would agree with you in my personal experience as far as like going to school for music. Um, and then also having like YouTube university, basically, you know, you end up mm-hmm. access to all these different resources. But yeah, the connections can be really tough if you don't live in an area or if you're not in person in an environment or community of people who are actually doing it or working in the industry it can be kind of hard to break through that. Yeah. yeah, I guess the it's it's kind of like moving, moving to New York or L.A. or I mean, I guess even Austin or Chicago versus like $80,000 in debt every year, I feel like it still weighs itself out to like maybe just trying it without the schooling. But I mean, I think it also depends. If you want to write like John Williams, then maybe going to conservatory or like mm. proper schooling. But if you want to write like, I mean, any anyone that does electronic stuff or anyone that does modular scores or like Trent and Atticus, you know, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, like I don't think you necessarily have to go to school for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I would agree. Totally. Well, you've got a lot of really cool toys. I was like binging your Instagram last night and just scrolling and seeing like all the live videos and stuff you've done and all the toys. I mean, you use like a lot of Moog stuff, a lot of Electron, a lot of really cool things in your studio. I would be curious to talk about some of your process and how you're using those things or like your your chain with your vocals. You're obviously a vocalist. You sing. You do a lot of really interesting processing. Like I mentioned earlier, Frost with your album. Um, maybe we can nerd out a little bit and talk more in depth about some of these things. Yeah. I know you also do a lot of field recording, too, with like mm-hmm. your samples. I'd be curious, like, do you record that on your iPhone? Do you have like a field recorder? What does that look yeah. like? Yeah. Well, for the field recordings, it varies. I think um, my first recorder, which I still have and I still use, is the H4N. I was actually looking at, the, at buying that last week, that same exact it's one. It's so solid. And it, what's great about it is that it has like the XY microphones, but then it also has two ins. Mm-hmm. So in theory, like, you know, and some of the older videos that I used to do, it would be like, you know, vocals in one in, um, an OP one in another, and then I could record the field recordings and kind of combine that all in one and that's it was cool. really cool that then you don't need an interface you don't need a computer so that's really what's great about that um but on the flip side it's it's bulky and it's you know it's kind of the interface is kind of old i don't know if mm. they've redone it since i had it um yeah so that you know and then another one which i actually have on the my desk is the h3 vr which is like the uh the spatial one so the capsules on it if i take off this little dead cat hold on it has like the do what what is this called tetrahedron? I can't remember, but it's got like the oh weird the capsules like this. Yeah, it's got um, like four mics in different directions for like spatial audio. Yeah, so it's kind of doing like trying to do like ambisonics and all that um, cool. stuff. And what's and this one's really great because it's really powerful. It records all four signals. The only thing that's kind of weird about it is that it has to be optimally like on a flat surface and a lot of the times if you're like trying to record water you're like trying to figure (laughs) out where to put 
So yeah. um, what ends up happening a lot is I record a lot of stuff on my iPhone as well, just because like it's unless there's like a crazy amount of wind, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of how I capture all that stuff. And it's nothing fancy, you know, it's like I think it's more in the processing and kind of like EQing mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. That stuff happens. But um, I try to sneak in at least a field recording in every track that I do. Even if people can't hear it, just for me to know that there's like an organic element in there. Yeah. Since yeah. so much of what I do is synthesized, it makes me feel better, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I've been wanting to do more field recordings. Um, I just normally have used the iPhone thing because it's just convenient and doesn't weigh as much. But yeah, I was also looking at the the Zoom H6 and I it's like the four, but it has two more inputs. And it's only like $60 more. Um, and the interface is updated too. So it has like a little mixer, mm. which is great for podcasting. So if I just wanted yeah. to do a podcast wherever, it'd be really easy. Yeah. And doesn't uh, Teenage Engineering has one too, but I think it's crazy expensive. It's like the really little one. And then it has like the mixer attached. I can't rem I, I think they do. I don't know. All of their stuff, like the design is so nice, but then it's always like so much more expensive. Is it the TP7? Maybe. Or, I mean, they definitely have like a little mixer, um, which I've looked at and, but it's just like, I don't know. I feel like at that point, I can just, I don't know. I, I yeah, just haven't. it's real expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, so it's like $1,200 versus like 250 Yeah. Yeah. And the, I mean, the H4N, ha I've had it for 15 years and it still works. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's and awesome. it's double uh, A batteries. I mean, it's, you, you kind of can't go wrong. The only thing, yeah. again, and I don't know where mine is now, but it's, it's, it's clunky. I mean, it's like, imagine the remotes that like are at your parents' house, like times two, cause they're just, it's like really, yeah. Um, it's a big remote. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. um, but yeah, so the field recordings are definitely a big part of things. And I think thematically, they also help me kind of get in the zone when, um, like on my previous record on Natura, it's like, it was all like forests and, you know, bird noises, which has become such like a memeable thing, right. Of like the, the everyone put, like throwing bird noises into things. Um, yeah. but you know, just kind of like nature sounds into that. And then this newest record, um, has water sounds. So it's like, it, it's, it's for me, it's like a way to tell a narrative story, even if I'm the only one that pays attention to it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And that's been cool. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love adding like realistic sounds into music. It just gives it a whole different energy and you're putting the song into an actual live environment that I think resonates with like your subconscious mm -hmm. interest as like a human because <laughs> it's like real yeah. life being inserted into this digital world of a song. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And when I'm performing live, it's nice because I try to not break songs like, you know, don't try to not have songs, but just a continuous soundscape during performances mm. and so field recordings can kind of bridge that gap too because it's like the types of shows and venues that I play are usually like a more experimental crowd anyway so they yeah. don't mind listening to some field recording for like the 15 seconds it takes for me to like change my pattern on my digitact and digitone and whatever so yeah. um it's a nice little like buffer um to be able to use that's cool yeah so for your live stuff I mean you mentioned live performance like I know that spatial audio is like part of what you do for live sound and also you have visuals that kind of go with what you're doing. Maybe talk about your process with that. Like how how do you record or set up your performance for like surround sound? Like what does that look yeah. like? Yeah. Well, uh my the rig that I use is actually it's like this board right here. It's like the largest pedal board that Pedal Train makes and it's got um my SP, the new SP404, which has been like a game changer for seriously, um, yeah. a Digitact, a Digitone, an Artoria key step to trigger the Digitone, uh, a mixer, a uh, blue sky, a looper, and then uh, what's it called? Boss VE500, um, uh, cool. which is a kind of recent addition um, because I used to sort of, it used to be two other pedals before that. And it's been like a bunch of like Earthquaker devices or Maris pedals. Um, but this one's specifically made for vocals and it's just so easy to go between presets. Cool. And then usually up here, I either have the mixer or I've had um, a Novation, um, one of the pads that kind of looks like a push, but is way smaller. And um, so I feel like when I perform like just ambient and the, what I've been trying to do is 
perform without a computer, but for spatial audio, obviously, um, I bring in the laptop and Ableton, um, actually, because it's, I just don't have the hardware set up in a way, you know, the way that like Suzanne Chani does, for example, where it's like the outs of her Buchla are the outs, the four spatial outs. Um, Interesting. Whereas for what I do, I usually actually use um, a Max for Live. Is it SPAT? No, I use, okay. uh, I, it's Surround Panner, uh, which has been really great. That's been around for a while. Yeah, I've never yeah. tried it, but I know it's, it's pretty popular. Yeah, and it actually works really well, especially for um, if you're just trying to do kind of like 5.1, quad, 7, you know, like anything that's not like super, super involved. Um, it's good. And especially now with Ableton CPU issues having been resolved a little bit with 11 and I don't yeah. know, just in general, it's been really good to use. And essentially what I tend to do with it is that I'll assign... Um, even each, you know, I'll have each of these elements that are on the board coming in as their own channel, and then they'll get a surround panner. And um, sometimes I leave some channels just kind of like in the center or I'll pan them like hard right, hard left. And then otherwise, um, I have this, one of these, you know, like Korg, can't really, it's not focusing, oh, yeah. uh, controls. And you can kind of like set, in Ableton, you can set this to be like an X and a Y. And so I kind of, place things in a starting position and then sort of with that can sort of like move things around um, as I'm performing. Cool. It's awesome. Um, it's a little bit rudimentary. I know that there's better um, panners out there. I think there's one called Envelope, which is made by like a studio that does spatial sound concerts. But I've found that this is really stable, like using a surround panner with this kind of like um, moving along the axis. And of course it's like, it's really hard to move seamlessly in like a circle, for example, just because you have to be so precise with like the X, Y. But if you're trying right. to just go kind of like back and forth, left and right, if you have like a quad setup, for example, of with like four speakers, then it's pretty effective. Um, That's and, cool. and yeah, and ideally, I mean, uh, at Moogfest in 2019, they, have a, they had a 7.2 system. So oh, wow. it was more... It just meant that the sound could kind of like travel. You could kind of hear it in different spots better. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't. I don't know. I think spatial audio still has a long way to go until it can get to the consumer level. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and it's what I studied in my masters. So you know, I had access to these labs with like eighteen speakers and was doing stuff in Max MSP. But Max MSP for live is, um, not really stable. Um, which is why I think Max for Live is sort of like the next step of like stability. But even that, like, you know, sometimes the CPU just goes a little. Yeah. Nuts. I just had a conversation with Josh Boone from Cycling74, mm -hmm. and he was saying that they've been upgrading a lot of the stability issues with Max for Live setups. And you can download a lot more scripts. They're releasing more. I don't know if you wouldn't really call it a pack, whatever it's called, that you could download for like a template basically for live setups that are a lot more stable now. Yeah, yeah, I think that between between them and then even Tom Hall, I think does a bunch of stuff in um, spatial audio. And I mean, I think everyone, it's a very buzzy word, right? Like everyone talking about Atmos mixes and- Yeah. Um, but realistically, it's like how many venues can have a speaker array? <laughs> so. Yeah, it's kind of a specialized live performance thing, which is really fun. And it's really cool if you know what you're doing and know how to program that stuff. But- It'd be really cool in the future if you start to see more venues incorporating that kind of stuff. But then again, it's like if you're not producing music for that specific purpose, does it really make a difference that much, really? Yeah. But there's um, the SPAT devices that was released probably like seven or eight months ago by Music Unit. Oh. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a new pack. It's like $140. Maybe you could get it from free. Just hit up Ableton and be like, yo, hook me up. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's made by Music Unit and it was produced in collaboration with EarCam Institute. Oh, okay. So it must be pretty good. Yeah, it's really legit. They also have like a bunch of different reverbs that come with it to like imitate acoustic qualities of rooms. So if mm -hmm. you even if you're using headphones, you can basically simulate like surround 5.1 sound and you can have up to uh, 32 speakers or channels 
outputs. Wow. That's nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. You should check it out. You probably would really, really like it. And since you have oh access God. to a lot of these, you know, surround sound systems when you perform, might be worth testing out sometime. I'd be curious to hear what you think of it. Yeah, there's a there's a venue here in London called Earth that has uh, one of those Lisa systems, like the L acoustics um, systems oh, yeah. built in, but they but they those never nice. use them. So I'm trying to like, you know, get in, kind of get in with them and be like, hey, let's do hey, stuff. What's up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, because honestly, like when I was so when I was in grad school, um, I was doing a lot with we used to call them Fritz because I think that that's like the model, but um, I think it's Neumann or like it's it's like the binaural head. So we used mm. to do that recording a lot. And then there's a software called MATLAB that I hope has been discontinued that is like this, or it's, <laughs> it's, it's more for like physics and like imaging, I don't know. But we used to simulate, you know, record impulse responses and then create reverbs and spine, you know, like all this stuff uh, with it. So I'm excited to check out what you told me, but it's also a little triggering because I feel like I'm like <laughs> thinking back and like popping balloons and staircases and stuff when I was like, my yeah. 20s. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I would do some impulse responses for Ableton's convolution reverb. That's as far as my experience goes with that. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the experience. That is the experience. You know, I, I yeah. feel like everyone thinks things are so much more complicated, but sometimes it's that's just what it is. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you do play with spat, let me know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So as far as like other things you're doing, your vocals, we mentioned vocal stuff. Maybe talk a little bit about it doesn't have to be with your your Frost EP, although I mentioned that, and it sounds like you did a lot of vocal processing with that mm -hmm. EP. What does your workflow look like? Yeah, I um, so for vocals, and I know this is kind of counterintuitive because I think other people record clean vocals, as clean vocals as they can, and then manipulate them with an Ableton or Cubase or whatever. But for me, I feel like it's really important just because I'm such a type A person that if I have a clean vocal, it's like I'm never going to settle on like, how it has to sound like I'm going to be tweaking it forever. So the, my, solu my solution to that has been to like, essentially just like uh, cave to the idea that my vocals are just always going to like the, the sound of the vocals that I do is just always going to have that more like textural sort of like going through guitar pedal type sound. Um, and I think that that adds to kind of like the organic quality that we were already talking about. Um, so I use a lot of pedals kind of going into the computer and then the vocals are really, it's more just about like EQ compression, um, maybe a little bit of, you know, delay and distortion once it's in Ableton. But um, the pedals, so, you know, I mentioned the pedals that I have on this pedal board, which serve me pretty well, but it's nothing too crazy. But in the past, um, I've had um, some of my favorites has, have been um, Earthquaker Devices has a pedal called, um, what is it? Something Dispatch. And it's really great. It's like a white pedal with like blue kind of designs on it. Um, and I think it might have been discontinued. But it, Dispatch that's, Master V3, is that it? Yes, yes. Okay. The Dispatch Master has been really great. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of stuff with the Hologram Electronics uh, Microcosm just because it um, it's so dense that in a way it's kind of fun to not know it inside out because you get all these happy accidents um, yeah. just because it has its own looper in it. And then it has like, it can do granular stuff and time stretching and time stuff. But then it's like, if you're not looping like exactly in time, then it's, you know, starts to do all sorts of crazy stuff and you mm. do reverse. And then, so I've been able to achieve a lot of really cool uh, textures with that. Um, yeah. And for example, on Frost, the last track on it, um, is actually all, which is called Suspiro, I believe, um, is all just vocals. And, you know, by the end, it sounds like there's pads and whatever, but it's all just generated with a microcosm. And um, and I don't know, there's something beautiful and kind of like the improvised nature of what can happen with pedals. You know, whenever I am recording anything that I do, it's usually starts as a performance that gets recorded and then I'll go in and kind of like mess around with it. And what other pedal? I mean, the this Boss pedal VE500 has been pretty great. Um, it doesn't, I think it's more sort of for like the loungy singer, you know, it's like the perfect thing if you want to add like a little bit of reverb and like a little bit of delay and a little bit of like octave, but it's definitely not like a TC Helicon. Um, 
Yeah. Which sadly has been discontinued. And it's like all the ones on Reverb. Was it really? Yeah. Like the one that like, because like the classic one, which is like the one that like Kimbra used, for example, it's like, yeah. you can find them on Reverb and eBay, but they look so beat up. And I'm just like, mm. I don't know. For something that I feel like I'm going to use so much, I like would rather just have it be like newer and. Supported. Yeah. And then another um, pedal that I love, that's another one of those kind of like crazy ones is the Maris Enzo which is like a hundred percent meant for like, um, like proggy guitar, but I've used it on vocals and you can get these like really distorted high frequencies and, um, and just kind of like crazy stuff. It's, it's, it kind of ends up sounding like what a Lyra eight sounds like, but with your voice, mm. um, which I've used in the past sort of as like layering or in scoring um, and then there's another, another, I feel like I like all these crazy pedals. There's another one called the auto. You have a lot of pedals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, the Maris auto bit is also great. Cause it's, it kind of, it introduces stutter and it's a cool way of creating glitch with my voice and with sort of, like, Oh, that's cool. I've actually been looking for more effects and I've just been using like effects racks and processing glitchy stuff for vocals, but it'd be fun to have something hardware, some analog glitchiness to like mess with yeah i mean the auto bit is is wild for that that and then uh there's the blooper pedal which is the chase bliss one that i think is also like super popular um i had one of those and actually sold it because it was just so um i wanted to use it live and it was just like you you kind of like the moog stuff you like accidentally like move a dial too much and then you're like whoa i'm never getting whatever i just had back so you're just like okay <laughs> you know <laughs> that could just be great or terrible yeah that's my one qualm with the and i love as you might have seen i love moog stuff that's my one reasoning why i never use them live i always sample mm. any moog stuff and just throw it into the sp404 because it's like I will, it's like, I don't know how somebody like Alessandro Cortini or people that like use even the Mother 32 live, like how they get the same sound over and over. Like they, they don't. They're, <laughs> yeah. Or like their Mother 32 must just look like, like a kid went crazy with like colors, you know? Cause like people yeah. put the little like um, arrows and stuff on, I don't know, to each their own. That sounds like a headache, honestly. Like I have a hard enough time just making sure like my system or redundancy is like solid for a show, let alone having to worry about all the dials being perfectly like set for yeah. an analog, something like that. Yeah. Well, there is one other pedal, um, which you talking about this makes me think about. It's called um, Drone Thing. It's by a company called Electrofaustus. And it's just a um, four or five oscillators and an LFO. And it's great because when it's in tune and you can, you know, like fil there's a filter on it and it has this really cool sound. And But again, if you're like in a dark venue and you're trying to play live and you don't have time to tune it, then it just becomes a disaster. Then it's more stress than it's worth. Um, yeah. yeah, I honestly, when it comes to like any kind of modular stuff, like live performance kind of scares me. Do yeah. you do you know uh, Sylvanesso? Are you familiar with the that band? So yeah, Nick yeah. Was, Nick was just on the podcast, and he is a wild, crazy guy when it comes to his modular live setup. And like, it's literally just happy accidents every show. And he does crazy amounts of routing and processing. He was explaining his his modular rig setup, and he's running um, her vocals through his modular and manipulating it on top of manipulating stems all through like his modular. And it's like, he lost me halfway through that episode, <laughs> just telling yeah. me how he was doing all that. The folks that do, I mean, I, I dabble in modular stuff and I definitely like use it a lot within the studio or for film scores when I can kind of like do these half hour sampling sessions and I just sort of like mess around and then go chop it up, you know? Um, but when it comes to live, like a few of the, I've only done a few performances where it's like, I'm using modulars, like, you know for like an Instagram live or whatever. And it's mm. always, by the end, I'm always like, oh my God, like, I hope that sounded okay. Cause it's just <laughs> like, it, there's, yeah. it's so volatile. So I, I respect people that know how to use that stuff live, like so, so much. Yeah, that makes me nervous. I'd rather have like predictability and stability with everything I do in front of people. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, I mean, you mentioned voc uh, visuals, like, you know, when it comes to like, if you're trying to trigger visuals in time with what you're doing, I don't think that there's like, unless you have one of those like modular visual rigs that like, you know, is taking in like 
uh, CV or some sort yeah. of like BPM data um, or something from like a, a PAM's new work, you know, like from, from like something that keeps time. I think that like anytime I perform with visuals, if they're too tempo, then it has to be with Ableton. Um, yeah. And I usually do like Ableton to Resolume and just, you know, kind of connect them via I IAC. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course that becomes like very intensive on the laptop and I've tried doing two laptops, but then it's like, that just, that's just insane. You know, I'm not like, so, you know, if I was still Vanessa, sure, two laptops is fine, but like. Yeah. You have a whole showing, team behind you that helps you like set up for every single show. Yeah. Yeah. But like for me showing up at like a 200 cap or like 150 cap venue with like all this stuff, it's like, it's just, it's not, it's just not worth it. So yeah. Um, yeah. I've started just kind of creating, you know, pra like while I practice for live shows, just sort of like clocking how long my improvisations usually are. And then just sort of making like a 45 minute block MOV that then front of house can just trigger. Um, just to kind of avoid the headache of like forgetting to trigger the visual for like one specific thing or like there no be being no visuals at all. Um, so yeah, and I've just told myself once I have a bigger team, I'll have the the Ableton backing tracks and the Resolume and whatever. But yeah, um, honestly, the type of artist that I am, I don't know if that's necessarily ever going to happen. So yeah, and that's okay too. I mean, it's really yeah. whatever you, it's whatever you want it to be. You know, that's yeah. That's the the game of the live show world is you can go as crazy as you want with like more risk or you can like scale down and keep it predictable and like have fun within your own zone of what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I also really love Resolume and I've used that mm -hmm. quite a bit for shows in the past. You said you're using I IAC. They actually have a really great, it's like, I forget what it, exactly it's called, but Resolume, I think it was just a couple years ago, they have... They released their own supported Max for Live device that basically sends oh. OS sends OSC. You just type in the the OSC path from Resolume, just copy and paste it into mm. the Max for Live device. Makes it really easy. All right. yeah, yeah, that's probably easier. I I feel like you know it's funny. It's it's like when you start to like realize that you're starting to show how long you've been like doing stuff because it's like I feel <laughs> like I figured out a setup that worked for me. I think it was like before the pandemic. So it's like, I haven't like researched anything else. Cause it's like, well, it works. Yeah. Um, but That's I mean, great. you're giving me some great tips though. No, I, I got to look into all of these things. That's why I do this podcast is like selfishly. I just get to learn from more talented people like you who like teach me about all these pedals and all this other nerdy stuff that I get to use later. Well, and then you share the knowledge to all of us. So there you go. Right. Yeah. It's a win for everyone. I hope. Yes. But you do a lot of analog processing with your pedals going into the laptop with your vocals, which is really mm -hmm. cool. Are there any favorite Ableton stock devices that you really love for it, vocals or just really anything in general that you use regularly that comes to mind? Uh, I have to say I've been really not using a lot of Ableton devices lately. Like I've, I've used some like Max for Live, like there's one called IOTA. Um, which I think is Dylan Baston made oh, yeah. where you can kind of like choose um, like spectrum, you know, it can kind of like choose from like an audio spectrum and that's really cool. I feel like I mainly use Max for Live stuff, less of like yeah. the kind of, and I know that there's a lot of really cool new stuff that's come out that's like, you know, especially with like granular type things, but I just feel like I, I like opening and like a new plugin or a contact and like loading something in. Um, for mm. some reason, um, I'm trying to think. There's another one which I can't remember who made it, but it's also a Max for Live. Um, it's called Patter, and it's kind of like I've you heard can create you can create patterns that are kind of polyrhythmic um, type stuff. So that's been cool. Is that more for drums or rhythm, or is that? Okay. Yeah, it's just to kind of randomize things. So it 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 kind of helps. It's it helps me in the beginning phases if I'm kind of stuck and trying to like find a pattern, whether it's like I'm running, you know, a field recording through it to kind of be if I see here, if I can find anything glitchy or like anything that kind of oh, like okay. sounds cool, or it um, can sometimes be used as like a crazier version of um, like Sound Toys Tremulator, you know? Oh, I love Which their stuff. Yeah. Is, I think the tre Tremulator and Echo Boy are like my two favorite Sound Toys ones. And I mean, yeah. the Tremulator can, it it's, you can go so crazy with it, but you can also just be so um 
classic with it and just do like a Wurlitzer sort of like wobble, you know, which is, mm -hmm. I feel like what's nice about it. Um, yeah. But some of my favorite, I'm trying to think, there's, um, there's a brand called, and I never have to say these out loud, so I don't know if I'm butchering <laughs> all these names, but I think it's Aberrant or Aberrant DSP. Um, Not sure. And they make two really cool sort of like uh, effects processing um, plugins, and one's called Shapeshifter, um, which is kind of like a tone machine. You can kind of like add in a lot of um, stuff, and then Sketch Cassette, which you can is a tape emulator, and you can you know add wobble, you can add crackle, you can add all these things, and it kind of like adds so much more of like analog flavor to anything. Mm. So you know, even if I'm using like a Diva or a Zebra patch, I'll slap one of those on, and then all of a sudden it sounds like it's you know like an actual synth that's cool um which is cool because like for me it's like if as long as people don't listen to my music and go like that's a stock sound from hmm. something you know from omnisphere yeah. or something like that's my like worst nightmare is having somebody like and i and it happens when i watch movies all the time that i'm like i have literally used that patch from zebra and this person didn't even like change it to like fit <laughs> yeah. their project and it makes me so mad um <laughs> But again, I understand like sometimes it, you're in a time crunch or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And another small company that I really like for plugins is Good Hertz. Oh, yeah. Ever Make great dealt. stuff. They sent me like an NFR for all their stuff. And I feel like I need to spend more time playing with it. Yeah. The wow control is great because it has a, um, a space kind of like spatializer. You can um, a widener so you can like widen things. And then it has some cool um, old keys emulators to it mm. and then the wolf compressor is incredible if you're looking for like kind of like a distortion-y yeah um, i haven't played with that one i know lossy i've played with their lossy plugin which is really cool it adds like yeah. all kinds of weird textures and it's almost kind of like a weird like bit reduction slash harmonizer type of thing it's weird mm -hmm. yeah it's cool um have you ever used speaking of sort of like modular adjacent have you ever used noise engineering's plugins Mm -mm. No. So they're like a huge, um, obviously, obviously like Eurorack modular company, but they now also make uh, plugins that emulate their more more famous um, modules. And I have to say, I have a lot of their modules, and I sometimes use the plugin version because really? it's more it's more stable. Just when I'm doing like film scoring work, where I have to like be able to change it quickly, it's like knowing that I can just go and. If it, it instead of it's you know being a C, it has to be a B flat. I can like go, and I don't have to tune it. I don't have to like patch it in again. It's just like there, saved as a preset. Yeah. Um. That's cool. So it's it's sort of like a way to get modular flair into stuff without having to like have the modules. Yeah. Um. So that stuff's been really, really great. Um. Yeah, we yeah, have a lot I, of toys. I, <laughs> Yeah, I have a lot of plugins. I have a lot of toys, and I have a lot of small toys. That's the thing. It's like, like it's just I really like the small portable things. Whether it's like, you know, I have the No Coast, uh, and the Strega by Make Noise. I have like, uh, Moog made this little um thing that I actually think the guy from Sylvan Esso like did the the um the video for when they first announced it. It's called the Siren. It's like this little colorful uh, box. Okay. Um. So yeah, I just love, I just love like pedals and little things. I just love like accumulating rather than like a, a lot of other people that I know just have like big synths and that's their thing. Mm -hmm. Mine is definitely all like the small little yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it sounds good, it sounds good. I don't know. I'm like becoming more of a, of a believer and not like going out and spending money on shiny toys. Like, like VCV rack, for example, is free. And like mm -hmm. you can get some amazing modular sounds and like if, even if you want to teach yourself modular, if you're like newer, I mean, it's a great resource to start with, you know. Yeah. Spitfire Labs is incredible. I mean, it's oh, yeah. all free, you totally. know, like there's just there's so much that you can do. And I don't know, do they still do Ableton like Ableton like free sessions or like light? I don't even know if they do like they had released their packs and I think it was version, was it version 10 that they came out with the Spitfire packs, like the upright piano and right. the brass orchestra or whatever it was called, the string, Spitfire string ensemble, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. called. It sounds pretty good. I still think I would rather use like a, a different 
plugin for strings if I was going to go the strings route. And I know you've done a lot of that. So I'd be curious, like, what are your top picks for like orchestral libraries? Yeah. Um, so I've only ever worked with like a big ensemble once. And it was like a 40 piece that I recorded remotely in um, Macedonia with this ensemble called Fames. And they do a lot of like remote sessions and it's terribly affordable. Um, which, you know, I think it's just because it's like Eastern Europe and I feel like the just the scaling of things is mm. um, different. But I really like using uh, Chamber Strings by Spitfire mm. uh, to mock up kind of orchestral stuff before I record. Um, the London Contemporary Orchestra, who I've worked with um, a couple times, has their own library that has more like effects and um, like cooler sounding harmonics and kind of like wobbly strings and things like that. And that's really great. Cool. Um, so I think it's just called LCO strings and they also have like a textures, um, plugin, which I think is also, um, Spitfire, which is really cool. And, um, for more like horror and tension stuff, uh, Sonic Couture has, um, a pack called Threnody, which, you know, it sounds, it, I think it's called Threnody because of the Penderecki piece, Threnody owed the victims of Hiroshima or like, I mean, it's, it's, mm. so it's like these, you know, imagine what, um, what would be using like there will be blood or yeah. like a Johnny Greenwood score. So like, if you want that, like Johnny Greenwood, like gritty strings or uh Haushka from all quiet on the Western front type of stuff, then Threnody is definitely great for that. So those are kind of my go-tos. Um, Albion five is pretty good from Spitfire. As you can tell, I'm a big Spitfire fan. I mean, they make good <laughs> stuff. It makes sense. Yeah. They do. And um, so those are kind of like my go-tos, I think. Yeah. Um, also, I'm going to, this keeps like slowly sliding down. It happens to me. At, <laughs> it happens fine. to me at like every show as well. No, no worries. I, yeah, I got a new microphone and I swear it weighs like 15 pounds. And like, I tried to use it on this boom stand because they sponsored the podcast. Like, here's a free mic by uh, PureTube. Have you ever heard of Lewitt, the mic company, Lewitt? They no. make a, a new pure tube mic, and it's honestly probably the best tube mic I've ever touched or heard in my life. Wow. But they sent it to me, and it weighs too much, so I couldn't use it for the podcast because I need to get a new stand. It just mm -hmm. keeps sagging this thing to the floor. I know. I don't know what people used to do. We, um, in the, in the, the, my house also has a bigger studio because we, you know, um, my husband and I is also a film composer, so, like, we have this, like, double setup, but he, it blows my mind that, like, the like Cole's microphones are so heavy and I'm like, what did they used to do? Those were used like 50 years ago. Like, how are they like balancing these like things over like the Beatles and like, you know, yeah. I just, it, I don't know, blows my mind. And meanwhile, I'm using the microphone that I had to buy when I first got to college. So this <laughs> microphone has been with me since 2004 and just doesn't want to die. Like I've never even changed. It's probably very unsanitary, but I've never even changed the cap. It's literally like the original, and I use this live every every single show. Oh, that's amazing! So there's some crust growing on the inside of it, probably. <laughs> there's definitely some, probably some Boston grimy stuff in there. It's definitely. It just adds oh to the God. vintage sound. <laughs> it does. I'm sure it does. I I really want. I mean, I'm hoping that this sounds good, but I really wonder if that adds some of the special. I don't um, know flavoring. It's <laughs> the flavor. Yeah, I'm sure it has a flavor. <laughs> That's a, Yeah, I'm that guy who brings a wet wipe whenever I go to a show or have to talk into a mic, even if it's just like a workshop. I'm just like wiping it off because I'm a germaphobe. No, I mean, that's why I use this for everything. At least I know it's like just mine. No one else right. has touched it. Yeah. And like venues are always like, you brought your own mic. And I was like, yes, I did. Yes. Thank you very much. I don't trust yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I respect that completely. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit about the process of some of your projects and what that looks like. Um, for people who maybe are really interested in what it would even look like to work for, say, a TV show. I know Cobweb, I think, is that one of your latest uh, projects mm -hmm. that you did? Yes. That's like a newer Netflix show? No, it's, or a, movie. it's, a, it's a Lionsgate horror movie, um, right. which yeah. had a very small two-week stint in movie theaters, but it came out at the same time as Barbie and Oppenheimer. Um, oh, but I that'd think, be tough to compete with because those are so, yeah. yeah. I mean, on the, on, on one side, it was nice because people that couldn't get into those screenings went to see Cobweb instead. Okay. Um, but I think the, I'm, I'm trying, I'm still trying to think of like what their long game was, but I think their long game was that now it's on VOD 
and we're getting into like Halloween season and it, the mm. movie takes place mainly on Halloween night. That so makes sense. I think they were just like leading up to it. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, um, that's in theaters. And then I had like totally opposite movie. I had a romantic comedy called Red, White and Royal Blue. Yeah, come I out saw on that. Amazon. Yeah, come, come out on Amazon Prime. Um, and that's awesome. obviously because like, you know, people love love. So yeah. that's been doing great. And of course the music cool. for that in my mind is so much more traditional, whereas Cobweb is really like what I want to be doing. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, it's always like, I mean, I think... Same thing with, you know, being a musician or producer, it's like, do you want to go the more complicated route? You know, the more mainstream you go, the, at least for me, the less fulfilling um, in terms mm. of sound. Like, I really love just kind of like experimenting with sound. So yeah. um, I feel like Cobweb, le Cobweb let me do that, whereas um, Red, White and Royal Blue was like lush chords and like love and... yeah. Very opposite vibes, <laughs> mm -hmm. Very which is cool. Vibes. Honestly, that speaks to your talent too, though, that you have that flexibility. You can go either way. So, you know, yeah. a lot of people get into a lane and there's nothing wrong with that of them just being really good at one specific niche of genre or style. And that's cool. But it, it's, I think yeah. it's awesome that you have that flexibility to go different directions. Yeah. I mean, it took, so to backtrack, I think you asked like kind of just about it in general. It's, it's, I think that now it's easy to just be like, oh, I just started scoring and whatever. But like the beginning process was like doing a lot of student movies, uh, doing a lot of sort of like work kind of for free. Um, my the the way in my mind, what made sense to kind of get started to like build a reel of music and to kind of like have a bunch of like examples of me doing scores to picture was to work with fashion brands and with designers because it was like there's just such a correlation be between like fashion and music. And I felt like it wasn't being explored on kind of like a more budget friendly um, level. So a lot of the early films that I scored were like short fashion films. Um, some of which like I went as far as like producing and either filming myself or like bringing a director in and being like, hey, I can make this happen for you if you let me score it. Of course, a lot of the payment for those things at the beginning was clothes, which I mean, when you're like in your 20s, like I'll take designer clothes. Like, yeah. sure, it wasn't like, you know, paying rent was like not fun, but like yeah. had, I looked great. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But so but, you know, that kind of like gave me experience. Um, all of a sudden, it's like I had something to put up on a website. And actually, the first film I ever worked on was a fashion documentary. So it's like, you know, it feels like a very natural progression to like. Um, and I think documentary work is a really great way for people to get into scoring because it's like oftentimes, um, I don't know, you just kind of like learn to work with a team and uh, the timings make it so that you can kind of like work. I, I don't know. I, I just, I feel like documentaries are like a very real sort of like being thrown into the world. And if you can do documentaries well, then like you can definitely do features and TV. Mm. And, um, and that's kind of like how things started. So it was like the, the fashion kind of stuff and then documentaries. And then, um, my first TV show really was like happened through a bunch of people putting in a good word about what I was doing at the time. And, um, just, I think a lot of it is luck, you know, like we see, it's like, you have to have talent, but you also have to be at the right place at the right time. Um, and I think that that was definitely an instance of that. And it was a show called Dickinson, which came out on Apple TV plus. Um, and you know, it's the, I think the hardest thing for me at the beginning is like, there's this very big kind of chicken or egg situation that happens in a lot of creative, creative fields where it's like, oh, we can't hire you to do this because you don't have experience. But then you're like, but you, if you hire me, I'll have experience, you know? Yeah. So it's like, so I spent a couple years being like, I want to do a feature film and I was like well but you don't have experience and I was like but I can do documentaries I can do tv like just give me a chance and finally you know like that happened and then from there it's like you know it's just like one you know little stepping stone after the other um and the other week I was, I was actually on um IMDB which is the internet database for like movies and yeah media and um at the bottom of your page where it has all your credits it has kind of like a graph of um they stupidly, and I, I, I hate numbers. I hate Spotify plays. I hate Instagram follower numbers. I hate all of that. 
but they have like a way of rating your popularity on IMDb. And it's like, it was fascinating to see, I think there's like a zoom out of five years of like seeing my numbers. And it's like, I wish I could say that it was just like a straight line, but it's literally the most like ziggity zaggedy, like <sighs> really up and then all the way down. And you know, and then it kind of evens out, but it really has felt like that for the past mm. eight years that I've been doing this, six or, I guess it might be eight years, I don't know. Yeah. So it's just, it takes a long time. Um, if you are kind of having like an artist career end the scoring at the same time, um, I feel like if you're Tim Hecker or One O Tricks or, you know, even Mika Levy, like you can kind of come in at a higher spot just because like you've put in the work of being an artist for so many years, you know? Mm, yeah. And I feel like you've already established your sound. Um, but for me, it was like my artist stuff and my scoring stuff have kind of like I've been figuring out my sound at the same time. And one's definitely helped the other. So I'd definitely recommend anyone that wants to get into scoring to like keep writing your own music, have your sound because like nobody wants to hire somebody that sounds like someone else. So like the biggest suggestion is just like be yourself and like there will be somebody that wants to bring you in for like what you're doing. Yeah, that's great advice for people listening. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there thinking about like, you know, how do I even get started? But yeah, I think it's those baby steps over the years of just putting in the work and the time and being able to put yourself out there too and having like a solid looking portfolio that just looks mm -hmm. professional and something you can share and just keep building upon. Yeah. So, And I really think like we were saying like accessibility, like if you didn't go to some music school or if you did, you know, if you couldn't afford to like go to like a place where networking is a thing, like even if you can just do like a couple months, like if you can go to LA or go to New York, or if you're in Europe, like go to Berlin, come to London, you know, just like put yourself in the middle of the things and just like, just, just go all out. You know, it's, it's really beneficial because like, it's just so much of it is community. And like, I've ended up working with people who's, you know, my dog has like, was playing with their dog at a dog run and then we started talking and then five years later we worked together. So That's it's like, awesome. there has to, the, the, the human connect, connection aspect is still so prevalent within yeah. the film world, um, which is why now like LA must be a terrifying place with like the strikes going on. I can't even imagine mm. everyone like out of work. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's just, it's a mix of, like I was saying, like luck, talent, being at the right place at the right time and just in community really, I think for scoring. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Those are great points for people to listen to. Yeah. What, uh, what upcoming projects are you working on? Is there anything that's in the works that you're excited about that you can talk about? So I actually, like I wrapped red, white and royal blue and I wrapped a pilot that didn't get picked up that was being shopped around before the strikes and then cobweb just came out. So as I was kind of like coming back up for air to be like, let's work on another project. Everything kind of got shut down um, in May because that's when the writer strike started. And then yeah. the actors have been on strike since August, since July. I mean, they're like two, two months in as well. So I actually don't have anything that I'm signed on to movie or TV wise right now, but I did use this summer, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast to write my second record, like full, full length. I, I consider Frost more of like an EP, even though it's half hour, it's definitely like a record, but my like intentionally intentional second record, um, I've been working on that and I gave myself nine weeks. I gave myself from like, I think it was like early June to the day that I went on holiday, which was August 20th. And I just, you know, ended up with like a 10 track, 50 minute record that now is going to start getting mixed next week. So um, I guess Congrats. that that's like the thing. Thanks. It's, it was a very, for me, it was a very good way of working because I couldn't have a track and be like, I'm going to come back to this later. It's like the only way to get, get it done was going, you know, just pushing through. And when you don't have as much time to do something, then like you just really just do it. So, um, so, you know, it, there was something very valuable learned in this. And I told myself like, I can't edit it. I can only bounce stems once after, you know, August 20th. And that's what I've been doing this week. I've been bouncing stems so that the mixer can get to it yeah. because I could mix it myself, but I would be mixing it forever. So <laughs> I now know and can thankfully afford to have someone else mix it. And yeah. at least that way, it's like not going to stay up at night thinking about if I 
overcompressed something. <laughs> That's been my life the last two weeks. I'm doing a collab right now with a friend that I'm really excited about. And I decided to like mix and master it. I was going to send it off to him. I was like, nah, I'll do it. We've been working at my place. And I've literally probably bounced it for a final master like seven times right now. And I'm like, this <laughs> is just stupid. I need to like put a hard date on it and just call it done because I could keep playing with it for the next 12 years if I wanted to. Yeah, it's like so. when you call it like song final, <laughs> final, 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 final five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Or exactly. 30 or whatever. Yeah. Ugh. I've even yeah. had like a while ago, I even uploaded it to, to distribution. And then I was like, hey, I got to cancel this. I have a better version now. And it's oh like so stupid, really. At the end of the day, like you have to let go. You know, it's our life's work. I think it's so important to care. You know, on one side, it's so important to care because it means that like, you feel like you're putting something valuable out there, but at the same time, it's also like, it's so agonizing, right? Yeah. It's just like, yeah. And it'll never be perfect. And that's something yeah. I think you just have to come to grips with. I mean, I think that's like finishing is the most important thing when I'm teaching my students. It's just like the first like 70 to 80% of writing the song is literally the most enjoyable and the most mm -hmm. fun because the last 20% is the hardest by far yeah. to finish. Oh yeah. my God. And then the whole process of like releasing it, it's yeah. like, I hate it. Like trying to like email late, like sending stuff out to labels. And like, I would so much rather get like a hundred no's than like even five, like no response. Like just, just email yeah. me back a no. Like, please, yeah. I can see from the way from disco that you've listened to it. Just <laughs> say no, just say no. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the writing part, you're right. That That's definitely the best part of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It's part of the life we signed up for as like artists, producers, whatever. But, you yeah. know, I would rather be on that grind than not have that therapy in my life. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it's very fulfilling and rewarding when you do have that release or that song and you listen to it when it's out on Spotify or whatever. And you're like, yeah, it still slaps like that's the yeah. best. It's the best feeling. Yeah, for sure. It for is. Sure. Well, I want to respect your time. I think it's been like an hour Where's the oh, best yeah. place for people to connect with you if you wanted to, if, if people were going to hit you up about whatever or just follow you? I'm on Instagram a lot. Um, it's just at Drum and Lace spelled out. Um, I've been using Twitter more as well, and I'm at Drum and Lace on that too. I'm trying to get better with TikTok. So it's at Drum and Lace there as well. Um, and I feel like the best way to be in touch for anything is usually like a DM um, or I have contact info on Instagram or on my website. Um, and I try to get back to everyone. Like it might not, if it's, if it's an email, it might take a couple days. Sometimes it's taken a couple weeks, but I always try to get back to everyone. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, I'm, I'm pretty available. Let's say like if yeah. you wanted to reach, if anyone wanted to reach out to say hello or like had a specific question. The one thing I have to do is so many people ask me how I get started, how I got started with scoring that I think I need to write out a landing page and just yeah. have a link ready. Or share the podcast with them. Be or like, there yeah. you go. Now yeah. I can share the podcast. It's be a lot easier. Here's a link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Well, I should have asked you this a while ago. Do you prefer Sophie or Sophia? Uh, either. I mean, I've come around to liking Sophia better, even though it's like what my parents used to call me. Yeah. Uh, most of my friends call me Sophie. So it's, it's either it's whatever people cool. are comfortable with, but yeah. All right. That's how I am with Dan or Daniel. My mom calls me Daniel and my friends call me Dan, but yeah, I'm like older. So I'm like kind of liking Daniel now makes me feel younger. Yes. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. And it's like, I like the way that Sophia looks spelled now, but then, you know, it's just so much easier. Like my closest friends call me Soph. So then it's like, they, people just keep taking off the letters, you know? <laughs> yeah. Eventually it'll just be S. Known as S. <laughs> It'd be really hard to find you on Google. Yeah, that's, I mean, even you'd, you'd be surprised how hard it is sometimes to Google drum and lace because it's like, really? so much stuff comes up as like drum and bass or then like somebody like drum with like a lace. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it's, I should have chosen something that's like a little bit more uh, stand out, but then people remember it. People always remember drum and lace. It's an easy. It's a catchy name. I like it. Uh, yeah. How did you pick that name? Did you ever make drum and bass starting out ever? Or like, I, I liked drum and bass and, you know, acid and jungle and all that. Um, yeah. I was a big fan. And when I was trying to come up with, artist names um I had like kind of like a whole list and 
I kind of jokingly wrote down drum and lace as kind of a joke. And then I was like, wait a minute, this kind of actually works. It's so, catchy. Yeah. 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 I and mean, when you type in Google, it's like, did you mean this? And you're like, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did not. But drum and if you, yeah, drum and bass is also enjoyable. So there you go. For sure. Cool. Well, thanks, Sophie, for hanging out on the podcast. It was awesome meeting you and hanging out. And if for whatever reason you like come through Denver in the U.S., like hit me up. Let me know. We'd love to say hey or go see a show or whatever. Yeah, I've never been to Denver, so I will definitely let you know. And thank you so much for having me. This was great. It was great to chat. Absolutely. You would love Denver. There's mountains. The music scene here is really blowing up and it's a solid place to hang out. Yeah, that's what I've heard. So I'll put yeah. it on my list. Yeah, put it on the bucket list. Come see us. <laughs> Sweet. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Do me a huge favor, if you would, and hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you don't hate the podcast, please leave a five-star review. It would help me out a ton. Don't forget to check back on Tuesdays for new episodes. I plan on cranking out a lot more in the upcoming future. Also, if you didn't know, on Spotify, if you click on an episode on mobile, you can interact there and you can tell me what you think about this episode and other episodes and would be great to hear from you and see what you're thinking about the podcast. If you want to be the first to get new episodes and stay updated and get free new devices and sample packs and other stuff that I'll be sending out in the future, join the newsletter. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter and or check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to give this guest a follow on the socials. Give them some love for spending their time. And once again, thanks for listening to the podcast. I will see you next time. Later.